thanks uh, for being here. And please help yourself to uh, uh, hope you've had, we, we've had a few weeks to look at these paintings, and I hope you've taken some time today to look at And I hope you've got some questions you might want to ask the artist. You know, one of the really um, great things about having artists agree to come and talk is that um, so often if you go to a museum or you go to a uh, gallery, you see artwork, and you might scratch your head and you might wonder about it. But, um, you know, it, it can be difficult to, to know all the time what the artist is, is up to. But when you, uh, we, we have this great opportunity that when an artist comes and agrees to share their thoughts with us, you know, we should take advantage of that and, and ask questions and uh, uh, engage with them. And then you, uh, you don't have to scratch your head so hard. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to introduce to you um, uh, Sean Whiteside. He has a bachelor's degree from uh, Christopher Newport University and a uh, Master's of Fine Art uh, from Bradford. Uh, he's a professor at Bradford, teaching drawing classes, and, and so he's uh, um, used to dealing with students, I guess. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's a thing. It's a thing. Um, and uh, his work, he, I'm sure he'll tell you about it, but you've had a chance to look at it, the abstract work it, um, statement that it's influenced a bit by abstract expressionism. But if you're familiar with that form of art, uh, these will have, have significant differences from that as well, especially the finish to them, which is really quite um, remarkable. So if you have, uh, when, once he's done speaking, if you have questions ranging from thematic questions about what they're about to technical questions about how he achieves effects, please don't be afraid to ask. So without further ado, I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Sean White. Thank you. So good afternoon. You all doing all right, hopefully? Yeah. Good. So uh, let's start with the uh, the process here. A lot of people uh, question the, the process of the news. And what I do a lot is I incorporate natural processes. Um, these, these paintings, to a certain degree, uh, paint themselves. Uh, of course, I have a, a certain element of control. I'm deciding what colors I'm going to use, the, the general format, things like that. Um, but what I typically do is, is paint a very thin glaze, a very thin layer of paint, and then I'll wash some of it away or mix other colors with it. And my paintings are flat on a table usually, and then there's a big puddle in the middle of my painting. And where that water goes, and where that uh, sedimentation occurs, and where that evaporation occurs, that all helps determine the final appearance of these works. So there's a certain amount of it that, that I certainly control, but there are other elements, some of the specifics, some of the, the details and the nuances that are very much uh, out of my control. Um, I've, I've always been drawn to the more emotional, the more uh, expressive uh, subject matter. Um, and initially, I would represent that with some very intense, vivid, saturated colors. Um, so very vivid blues or greens or reds. But I, I quickly realized that many times people will respond only to that color. And they say, oh, well, you use a lot of red here. I like red. So the color, in a way, was distracting from some of the forms. Uh, this piece here is one of the oldest, I think the oldest, out of this batch. And this is after I had moved on from those very intense saturated colors. So here, even, we see a more earthy kind of, you know, red, orange, yellows. Um, and again, this is many, many layers, one on top of the other, and I'm removing of that paint I just put down. So there's an addition and a subtraction. This piece here, though, we can see stands out among all of these because it is relatively warm in appearance. Okay. Getting into the theme of my current work, I haven't been feeling very warm lately. And maybe you can kind of see that. Um, the, the, the title of this exhibition is Dark Age. Um, which might remind us of, of the 
middle age, it might remind us of something that is a little bit more um, cold, a little bit more um, confining. Okay? We don't typically think being in the dark is a good thing, you know, even literally or metaphorically. Okay, so you can see that there are a lot more uh, darker, more muted uh, tones. The palette itself is much more dark and muted. So in, in terms of the theme, um, I'm reflecting on our current state uh, as a country, as a society, and I'm not particularly optimistic. Okay? So maybe maybe some of you are, are seeing some things in our society, in our country, that are, are disturbed, that are troubled. Okay? I'm certainly feeling a lot of those things, I think. Um, this series here, okay, we have two over here and then one on the end, and one here. Um, these are inspired in part by an abstract expressionist uh, an artist named Robert Conewell. And to explain this, we need a little bit of backstory. So let's go back to 509 BCE, before the Common Era. Okay. And in 509, uh, most of Italy had been dominated by the Etruscans. And we don't know much about the Etruscans these days, because they, they achieved a very high level of civilization in Italy before the Romans ever did. And if we, we know more about the Romans, don't we? In 509, the Romans throw out the last Etruscan king, and they say, you know what, we're tired of all this monarchy crap. We want to have a new system of government where different regions will each have their representative, and those representatives will get together and they'll vote on the issues. Okay? And that was called a republic. All right? So we have this republic. Beginning in 509, but guess what? The republic ends. It does not last forever. And it lasts until either the time of Julius Caesar or the time of Augustus Caesar, depending on which historian you ask. Okay, but roughly about 475 years. That's, to my knowledge, the longest lasting republic in history. And it ended. Our country, uh, the founders of our country, based our system of government on that Roman Republic. They were looking at the, the benefits of that Republican form of government, a small r Republican. And they were looking at why it failed. Okay? Because the Roman Republic did not fail because it was conquered by another group. It failed from within. It became reorganized into an empire. Okay? And at that point, then you had emperors. You had people like Augustus Caesar uh, claiming that he was a descendant of Venus, and that's why he had the right to rule. Not because the people had elected him, but because he had divine authority. Okay? So we don't move more and more and more toward freedom inexorably. There are peaks and there are valleys. Okay. Fast forward until about the 1930s uh, in Spain. Spain was a republic. Okay. Again, after this, this model uh, that we knew well from the Romans. Okay. But there was a civil war okay, between the Spanish Republicans, again, small R Republicans, and uh, another force led by General Francisco Franco. Okay, who became a fascist leader in Spain. Okay? And we may know of, of his activities from uh, uh, Picasso's very famous painting, Guernica. Okay, have we seen that? It is about the, the first ever town to be aerially bombed into the dirt. It was a non-military target. It was mostly civilians. And this was an experiment between the forces of Franco and the uh, German Luftwaffe. Okay. Hitler's Air Force, essentially. Okay. So we mentioned that, that uh, Picasso was inspired to paint that horrific painting, Guernica, which is a huge 25-foot wide indictment of that horrific event. Uh, but then we also have Robert Motherwell begin a series of paintings with a similar subject matter. He called these uh, Elegies to the Spanish Republic. Okay. And he had several of these. I think he had over 100 maybe even 200, he explored this idea in a very non-representational, non-representational, abstract manner, okay? And at the time, in the United States, when he was painting these, yes, we had just gone through World War II, uh, 
uh, but Hitler had fallen, Mussolini had fallen, and Franco was still in control in Spain. Okay? Nothing was done to take Franco out of power. Okay? So that painting that Picasso had done, Guernica, he's, he left that to the people of Spain and said, but Spain cannot have this until Franco is no longer in control. Well, Franco no longer didn't, uh, uh, he wasn't conquered, he wasn't overthrown, he died in office. And that's, that's how he, he uh, uh, lost control in that pain eventually went to the Spanish people. Okay? And incidentally, people like Richard Nixon called him a great ally of the United States because he was opposed to Congress. Okay? So I've begun this series uh, based on some of the uh, uh, visual format that we see in Motherwell's work of the, the horizontal stripes and the more organic shapes between them. Of course, incorporating my own technique of, of using the water. Uh, and I call these uh, elegies to the U.S. Republic. Okay. At, at the time of the U.S. when uh, uh, Motherwell was painting his versions, again, we had gone through the, the Second World War. But we had also seen millions of, of legal uh, Japanese uh, uh, immigrants or people of Japanese descent put into internment camps. Uh, we had seen many legal Mexican residents of the United States deported because they were believed to be, Mexico was believed to be conspiring with Hitler. And we had seen these, these very frightening things in uh, the United States. And I suppose I'm, I'm thinking of these same questions that, that Motherwell was considering. If he had made a, a direct statement about the, the U.S. Republic, then uh, he could, could have faced more repercussions. Okay, we had McCarthyism, we had the Red Scare, we were hunting down communists. Okay? And many of these abstract expressionist artists, uh, whom I find inspiring, uh, perhaps, in part, turned more toward abstraction as a way of hiding some of their politics. Okay, because if they were, if they were uh, deemed to be too leftist, uh, then they could be uh, persecuted. Okay. Before that, many artists were working in a very social realist style, and that style got adopted by Stalin. Okay, so people probably didn't want to be associated too much with Stalin. Okay. So, I could literally explain to you the things that I think are wrong and solutions that I think we should face, but I have my own answers. By giving you these uh, more uh, open-ended, uh, non-representational, non-literal images here, I'm inviting you to ask questions. I'm offering you questions, okay? Such as, what does it mean to be a Republican? If we know what happened to the Spanish Republic, if we know what happened to the Roman Republic, should we assume that ours will last forever? Are the greatest threats to us actually uh, external? Do other countries actually pose the greatest threat to our Republic, to our freedom? Or could those threats actually be from within? And is it, in fact, possible that that Republican form of government our founders created, is it possible that that has already quietly slipped away? Okay, so I offer you these questions, okay? And, and I have a, a, a quote from John F. Kennedy, okay? To end with a, a quote from John F. Kennedy. I will read it in his voice. The life of the artist. <laughs> if sometimes our great artists have been the most critical of our society, it is because their sensitivity and their concern for justice, which must motivate any true artist, makes him aware that our nation falls short of its highest potential. I see little of more importance to the future of our country and our civilization than the full recognition of the place of the artist. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks. First. Yeah, that's uh, it, it, it's quite interesting. I think um, um, I don't know how familiar uh, many of you are with the uh, 
Robert Motherwell paintings that he's referencing. But, but especially these horizontal pieces um, have a, a, a compositional uh, uh, relationship <coughs> rhyme to them. Mostly, uh, it, they're, and they're most of the ones that are, they're elegies, right? The, 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 the um, uh, when, uh, when, you, when you title a work, uh, I often feel like that's your that's that's like one of your last opportunities to sort of push the viewer toward, when, especially especially, but not actually not only, but especially in abstract work, you have your you, you push the, the the viewer toward, um, uh, uh, let's just say like a, an avenue of thought, uh, without trying to tell them exactly what what's going on. You want to you want to push them toward an idea. Are there other titles in the show that serve that kind of way, serve in that function? Um, I've, I've been told that the titles I give my work uh, often seem very appropriate. So when they see the work, they look at the title, and they think, oh, OK, well, that helps me understand it. Uh, so in general, all of them will have that kind of title. And you're right, that is often the only verbal cue you have as to what uh, the content could be. Okay. I mean, you can look at it, you can get a, a general a tone and mood, but that, that title can give it just a little bit more specificity. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think really most of the titles are pretty significant, although I think that you can often get the, uh, the mood of it just from the imagery. But a lot of times I'll come up with that title or that theme first and then say, okay, well, how do I convey this? How do I convey that concept that I'm trying to convey? Any of you have any questions? Yes, sir. Oh, you said that it used to do vivid motions with different colors. Mm -hmm. um, since these are, since these use a lot, you utilize black a lot, were there any any uh, other intense emotions that you had when you, you were going through the process of making these? Uh, not specifically as I'm going through the process. Um, I, I hope what you can see in most of these works is more of a consistent sort of brooding yeah. quality. And some of that does come from a lot of that, that darkness and that, that blackness and the kind of cloudiness that you see there. So in, in that sense, my work does differ from uh, some of the abstract expressionists because many of them are very visceral. And, and you see that, that immediate, spontaneous uh, quality to their work. But, Overall, my works have a little bit more of a quiet quality to them, and that it's, it's more of a consistent brooding. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was going to another part. Now that you've said, you explained your reasoning for for making these, uh, I've always, every time I walk through here, which is at the end of the day when I go home, I always look at the one in the middle. And now that you say, like, uh, threats that can come from the outside, but we may have a threat that happens on the inside. Uh, like that inner darkness, I can see that as our country. That our country has an inner darkness while the white is trying to intrude into our country. But even with that, with, with the explanation now, I understand it, I understand it more and I uh, can actually see, see what you were going for. Yeah, and, and in a piece like this, um, it's called A Gate. And I, I am trying to, to focus on this big void that we have, this big chasm between those different sides. Okay? And we can interpret that in a lot of ways. We can look at you know, uh, inequality economically or, or racially or society or, or you know, different countries or you know, the, that, that dark place within. Yeah. So in turn, like psychologically, well, mm -hmm. So, yes. So, uh, uh, emptiness inside the individual. When you said about uh, uh, abstract expressionists, I was looking at a painting like this, and, and it, it has me in mind of uh, Mark Rothko, among the, of, of the abstract expressionists, who of them uh, was much more of a uh, brooding um, sort than. Um, it's a world-cooling, slashing, paint, uh, energetically. Um, 
and this even has kind of like these some these bars. You know, it's different, but it sort of it sort of again resonates with that uh, uh, rock film, with the format, the vertical format, and the horizontal bands. Yeah, definitely. Um, when uh, when I was learning the direction that I wanted to go as an artist. Uh, you have your studio classes where you get some of your technical abilities, but I actually found my art history class very informative as well. And uh, at the beginning of a, of a contemporary art history course, or a modern art history course, uh, our instructor gave us kind of a preview of the directions that we'll see in Mark. And she put up Mark Rothko's, it's an untitled work, but it's known as Four Darks and Red. And, and mentioned him a little bit, and that, that kind of brooding quality. And I saw that, and I wrote down his name, and knocked my socks off. And uh, I became very interested in Mark Rothko, and uh, uh, he was a very philosophical person. Uh, he did have that kind of brooding quality that I can certainly relate to. Uh, and so philosophically, my work uh, has, has very strongly been influenced by Mark Rothko. Sometimes visually, but Usually not. Um, uh, again, when I was doing those, those more bright, vivid, saturated colors, my work actually used to be very textural. It had a much more visceral quality to it. Uh, these days, it's a little bit more metaphysical. It has a little bit more of a detachment. It's, it's, it isolates itself. Okay, we see that in, in kind of the finish or in the smoothness. Okay, it's not a physical thing. It's a metaphysical thing. It's not about the world that we see, it's about the, the internal, invisible world. Uh, so, yeah, certainly if you see uh, qualities of, of Mark Rothko, that's, that's you know, it's not a bad thing. Yeah, not a bad thing. <laughs> and he, um, it's kind of interesting to see this installed this way, and, and you know, we had talked a little bit about labels, and, and I opted instead to have a, a title list because I, I don't like the way the labels intrude sometimes. And it's interesting to think about Mark Rothko. Again, you may not be all very familiar with Mark Rothko, but his um, one of the things that he would often do is he would create an entire environment of paintings, like a chapel he was famous for. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes, unfortunately not often enough, museums will keep that idea and, and intact that they will display things you know, uh, intact like this. And I thought this made a kind of a, um, uh, an installation to have it, um, to have them group like this. I mean, you were, you were very specific about how you wanted them laid out. They, they do kind of um, reference an altar piece in the, the, the sort of the shape of, the overall shape of the groups of paintings. Um, and I think it makes a, uh, it references Rothko again in that, uh, <coughs> in that it's presented as a unit, sort of. It's like a nice unit themed show. Um, so, I don't know if there's a question there, but I think it's just something else that I recognize yeah. as being connected to Mark Rothko. So you have this kind of connection to Robert Motherwell, you have the connection to Mark Rothko. And, and uh, you know, if you haven't seen Mark Rothko's work in person, it can be sort of hard to appreciate it because in person, or, or in a slide reproduction, it kind of looks like a series of stacked right angles. But if you're viewing it in person, you're seeing that transparent glazing quality uh, that I've certainly found inspirational. So you're seeing a, a transparency there. And you're also seeing this, this deliberate ambiguity of space. Okay, once you're viewing them in person, if you say have a, a blue rectangle and there's kind of a reddish border around it, you might assume at first that that blue is on top of that red. But in fact, many times you see that red on top of the blue. So there's this deliberate uh, ambiguity of space there. And there's this color depth where you're not just seeing a color, you're seeing through various layers of color. Uh, uh, and that, that really shows that there's so much, there's something inner. Again, referring to that, that more metaphysical or, or internal uh, uh, world. And I, I do find myself very interested in religious art. Um, many of the works, with the exception of these, these elegies, these elegies are very asymmetrical for me. Uh, and, and, for, and for that reason, they've been kind of exciting. and explore the system of rhythm of the, the lines. 
but also that, that asymmetry while still trying to achieve that balance. Yeah, but many of the other works have a very iconic quality. Yeah, they're approximately symmetrical. They're, they're, you know, the forms are large and in your face. Uh, many of the same features that we see in the old Byzantine icons. And they have a similar function. You're not meant to sit in front of a, an icon depicting Jesus and have it tell you a story. It's not there to entertain you or to narrate uh, a, a long story to you. It's, it's a chance for reflection and meditation and introspection. Um, so I, I am very interested in that, that you, know, you bring up the idea of an altarpiece. While I'm currently working on some works on paper that are taken in the format of, of an altarpiece, where they're hinged and they'll open up and you'll see an image on the outside and then they'll open and you'll see an image on the inside. Um, because I believe that my work serves that similar function, that, that meditation. Questions from you guys? Anything about technique? Right. Yeah, no, um, you said like, that you basically let these paintings paint themselves. Um, how long would you say one of these would take for an actual, like uh, for you to actually from start to finish, letting them naturalistically uh, paint themselves, as you say, uh, how long would you say these would take? Well, if we use sunlight or if we use regular light to try to evaporate the water. Uh, my, my studio right now has a few windows which are blocked up because it's too, it lets out too much heat. Uh, the other building where I was working before then had no windows. So sunlight doesn't enter into it at all. Um, as, as to how long these take, it really depends on how well things are going. Sometimes I'm painting amazingly, but nature is just messing things up, right? <laughs> uh, no, so this, my process is inherently experimental, and it's inherently you know, out of my control to a certain degree. So sometimes that goes well. Sometimes that works in a certain way, and I learn how to use that. Other times, especially when I'm experimenting, uh, that can go in an entirely unpredictable fashion, and, and I just hate the results. So each, each of these works will be about uh, five or six layers of color. And there's actually a layer of varnish between each layer of color. Uh, so when I, you know, I might glaze the surface in a thin coat of, you know, of, of, of color I've mixed, wash away some of it, and then there's a big puddle of water there, and then I can't do anything else with it for 24 hours. So usually I'll have three or four of these going at the same time, you know, depending on how much space I have. And if it's going well, if I'm in the studio a lot, I can finish a, a group of paintings in you know, maybe two or three weeks. That's only assuming that I can get into the, the studio as, as much as I like to. So one of the things that, that you'll realize, some of you, if you want to become artists, is that right now, while you're in school, art is your job. And you, you have all this time to work on. The, the more you get out into the working world, the more things are trying to eat away at that part of time. Oh, I have to go mow the lawn. Oh, I have to go do my other job that I do to make money so I can eat. Uh, oh, I have to do this. You know, my basement is flooding. I can't work today because my studio has puddles of water in it. I have to get everything up off the floor. So, uh, to be honest, I haven't painted anything since May because I've had to move my studio and everything's been in upheaval. And I worked on some uh, ink on paper works, but uh, you know, while I'm not working on things, my my creativity kind of comes to a grinding halt. And it's it's you really have to build that momentum. It's kind of like going uphill. You, know, you have to rebuild that creative momentum, and then maybe you can cruise and you're you're good to go. Uh, but if if that stops, if you're not getting into the studio enough, it can all come to a halt, and you have to get that brain going uh, another way. So, how many paintings have I done lately? Not much, lately. You know, so, uh, but you know, if things are going well, if I can get into the studio regularly, then I can finish a group of paintings within a few weeks. But again, that all has to do with what's demanding on my time at that moment and how well things are going. You know, my first couple paintings I do after this break, they're probably gonna suck. Okay. To be honest with you, they probably won't be very good. I'll probably have to start them over. I'll probably have to do something else. Okay. So that's another thing that inherently will eat into your time. If you want to
want to play it safe, then you can follow a formula and you can do well. Uh, if you want to experiment and do something new, then that's going to involve some failure. And that's going to take up time. So, I mean, you really have to be bold and say, I know my time is very limited, but I still want to experiment and perhaps fail because I'll be more happy with those results than I will be if I follow the formula. Speaking of uh, experimentation, did you like experiment with any other materials that you found that were nice that also complemented your work? Uh, yes. I, I mentioned that I'm doing some ink on uh, paperworks, and when I was in graduate school, we, all the graduate students kind of got lumped into the same drawing class, and it was a figure drawing class. And it was useful, you know, uh, observing from nature helps you understand proportion and things like that, and just the, the technical skill. Uh, but I really got into it when we started using charcoal. And I can make large areas of, of values the same way I could when I was painting. And then when I took an independent study drawing course, um, I wanted to use ink. And I had done pen and ink before, you know, the actual dipping the pen into the ink and, and you know, using patching and cross hatching and a very clean draftsmanship, you know, kind of quality. Uh, but I get, began experimenting more with uh, using the ink a little bit more like paint and mixing that with water and allowing the, the paper and the way that the paper will buckle when it's wet to help determine some of how those works. So in experimenting with that ink, and I did have to experiment with it for a while before I found things that you know, worked to my satisfaction. I'm kind of bringing that more toward the painting, and to a certain degree, I bring the painting more toward what I can achieve with the ink. So I would encourage anyone to be just a total dilettante and, and dabbling in, in several different media all at the same time. But if you can <coughs> stretch your comfort zone a little bit here and there, you know, try a different uh, a medium. Try a drawing medium if you're a painter. Or try you know sculpting or something. If you can do that, then you know working on several different works, working in several different media, can improve all of them. You know, in terms of technique, um, we were talking about abstract expressionists, and um, uh, I've always been really drawn to uh, William de Kooning and other. These abstract expressionist American painters from the 1950s through the um, uh, 60s, well, into you know, uh, the end of the 20th century. But one thing I always was impressed by William McCooney, that his, his, the, if you look at his paintings, um, I came to the conclusion, this is someone who understands his own methods incredibly well. Uh, and, and that, um, I don't know if that, um, Makes sense to everybody, but because you think, well, of course you do. You do. You, you're, you're aware of what you're doing. But but he he developed a, a whole system of, of of how Willem de Kooning works. Like he understood his own methods in a way that that is remarkable. So that he had this command of this completely unique. I don't think anybody. I mean, I've seen some people, especially Brown, maybe, or some other people who paint sort of like him, but he had. Developed. He, he got so uh, um, in touch with just his way of approaching things. And I think that that's something that artists uh, develop. I think it takes a very long time to develop that. It does. And, and the abstract expressionist movement was a very individualistic movement. There are many artists associated with this, this movement, and they, there are similar qualities. There's certain spontaneous qualities in a lot of the work. Uh, but each of the artist's works and their signature style. And that kind of individuality uh, was touted by the, the US government. The State Department took these paintings on tours of communist countries and said, see, look at what we can achieve when we value individuality. These days, after the fall of Berlin Wall and things like that, uh, we tend to, to mock that kind of work. Oh, that Jackson Pollock, he's just throwing paint around. I can do that. Uh, things like that, but you know, in, in the day, that individuality was respected. And you know, when the Greeks came up with this idea of democracy, it was because they valued the individual. Okay? If they believed that, well, I have my opinion, and anyone who disagrees with me is stupid, then that's the type of mentality that leads you to autocracy or a monarchy. 
Right? They only believed in democracy because they believed in the power of the individual. They said, you individual artists take pride in your individual achievement, sign your work. Other cultures did not have their artists sign their work. Okay? So artists signing their works and that, that foundation of that theory of democracy did not happen on accident. It had to do with that worldview that respects individuality. And these days, we are, you know, people tend to talk about, you know, us being, you know, say, oh, this is modern. We're not. We're not the modern age. The modern age ended in about the 60s. We're now in a postmodern age. And we're not reinventing things the way people were in the modern age. Okay? Today, it's all about appropriation. And there's a lot of borrowing and things like that. And so, uh, you know, it, it does take a while to learn your own technique, to learn what is it that I have to say or how can I take inspiration from another artist and yet say something different in a, in a different way? Uh, you know, I would, I would hope that, that those of you who are pursuing art or just interested in art uh, respect that individuality and say, what is it that I can achieve? Or what is it that this artist is telling me in the way that they're creating their work? So you might look at something like this and, and take the time to understand it and say, well, I see what they're doing, but I don't really care for it. That's fine, okay? But we compare that to uh, the, the, you know, uh, the other approach, where you don't take the time to understand it. And you say, oh, what is it? It doesn't look like anything. I hate abstract art. <laughs> <laughs> Which one would we rather be? Would we rather have that empathy? Or would we rather storm out and have a tantrum like like okay. Hopefully that's an easy choice for us. Yes, ma'am. How would you know when you figure out what your identity is? As an artist. As an artist? Well, uh, you know, you can, it can take different cues. Okay? It depends on what you want as an artist. Some people creating art, they want to make it art. That's all that matters to them. They see their art and they say, I have made this thing. It is pleasing to me for one reason or another. To some people, that might be enough. Other people, they simply want to please the market. Okay, so when their work is selling well, then they say, that's, that's good, that's what I want. I'm going to do more art like that so it will sell well. Okay. Some people, they, they receive that therapy from creating the art, but they also want to share it with other people. They want other people to see it. Maybe not necessarily buy it, but to see it. Okay, so it really depends on what you want as an artist. Um, if that work is, is speaking to you, if it uh, is therapeutic for you to create, if you are satisfied with the end result, and that's what matters to you, then you don't need someone else to validate it. Okay? If you want to be a practicing artist and show works in the, in the gallery and share that work with other people, then of course you do need a, a certain amount of approval from some outside force. Okay? Yes? Um. Say that along with would you say it'd be a good frame of mind to never be satisfied? You have to always want to push yourself further. Yes. The satisfaction is the death of desire. If you are satisfied, then you are immobile. You are not me. I have seen artists who are too satisfied with their own work. They they think they're they're super great and say, Wow, this is amazing. Uh, I'm perfect, and, and, and during critiques, you know, if you say, if you try to offer any constructive criticism for them, they just say, oh, well, obviously that person doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay? That type of artist is never going to get any better. Okay? You will only get better if you look at your own work and say, I can do better than that. Or this is working, that's working, but in the next one, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to use a little bit different color. I'm going to use a little bit different uh, technique. Never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. Kind of like that too. Um, to myself, that I've done it's not really fine art, it's just a model making, if anything. But I wanted some of my pieces to be seen, so I made a model of heroines that's on permanent display at the park. But every time I look at it, I always think about how I could have made something better, changed how I used the material, or the way I painted something. Yeah. Yeah, they, I mean, they often say that you are your own worst critic. And many people are, they, they see the flaws that someone else won't see. You know, it's great when, when your family says, oh, you've made this and this is amazing. 
because you're my special baby. And that, that's nice, because then you're always looking at it and you're saying, well, I know my work better than anybody. I can see that this, this, this here is not working. Uh, so if, if you're not doing that, then, then yeah, you're not growing. Be aware of those people who already think that they're you know, super and have nothing left to learn. Yes, sir. Um, what advice would you give somebody who's kind of going through a valley of uncreativity? A valley of uncreativity? <laughs> um, keep working. That's the advice I would give. No, actually, I, I, yeah, I had to, I had to jump in there uh, to, to just say I agree with you because um, when you don't feel like drawing anymore, you, you need to draw some more. You need to draw some more. Yeah. It, uh, isn't it Chuck Close has that great saying where he, he said, um, waiting for inspiration is for amateurs, professionals get to work. And you know, that's what you do, you just do it. Leave Bob Frost, just paint a happy little tree. And as I said before, when, when, you know, I've, I've been doing some things with the ink on paper and I've been trying to keep my creativity going. Uh, but when I start painting again, it's, it's probably not going to be good at first. But I know that I need to get through that and get frustrated and get mad and you know maybe tear up a canvas and mm -hmm. start again. But I know that that's what I need to get through in order to to get onto that creative road again. Keep working. When I started taking that um, independent study with the, with the drawing, I I didn't know what I was going to do with the drawing. I didn't know how I was going to make this ink work in any way that was comparable to what I was doing with painting. But my my uh, instructor said, go play. So I, I went to my play. And uh, Robert Mugwell, he used to call his, his drawings, he used to call them doodles. Okay? So doodle, play. Okay? Playing is experimentation. It's how we learn. They're teaching robots now how to play so they can learn how to do things, how to walk if they're disabled or work their legs or something like that. Go make more work to play. That's what I would say. Yes, sir? When you started a piece kind of like this, it's kind of a profound, you want it to make a profound statement and you know what you're trying to achieve, but have you ever started it and started to get into it and then felt kind of overwhelmed and kind of thought to yourself, why did I get myself into this? Overwhelmed by the process or overwhelmed by the, the concept I was trying to tackle? Both. Both? Okay. Uh, yeah, I felt overwhelmed by the process uh, simply because, you know, again, some of it can be hard to predict, it can be hard to control. Okay, but my, my painting and, and drawing process is really a metaphor for my worldview. You're not in control. Okay? You, you have certain you know, steps that you can take, but there are all these other factors that you can't predict that are going to intervene. So what do you do? You know, do, you, do you fall in defeat or do you get back up and, and keep working? And I'm not going to tell you if I don't get pissed off. Because okay, things don't work out well sometimes, and I'm mad. Right? Uh, but what choice do you have? You just give up? You just storm out and say, <laughs> No, it, it, it means something to you, so you fight for it. You, you, you make it work. Yes, <laughs> Should we go and just get some coffee? Did <laughs> <laughs> um, you find that your process uh, that you did? with uh, how you say let nature have some control. Would you say that was kind of sort of alleviating or more stressful? Um, it is both. It is both. Okay. It is alleviating, but it is, you know, it is liberating on the one hand, but it, it is stressful. Um, and the, the kind of process, uh, th this process, I really just sort of stumbled onto it. Um, I was looking at a... Um, I was doing an assignment for a history of photography course, and I never thought photography had anything to do with, with what I'd be interested in, but it turns out the history of photography lines up very closely with the history of painting. You know, photographers were trying to look like painters, while painters were trying to look like photographers. It's very interesting if you ever get the chance to study. But I was, I was looking at a, a work by Andre Serrano, um, where you know, he has some very graphic work, if you're familiar with it. Any of it. But he had this this one that was called Bloodstream, and it was, uh, you know, um, how shall we say, a sanitary napkin that had been bloodied, and there was part of it washed away. And you, you couldn't tell what the materials were unless you read about it. 
but it had this naturally occurring kind of cloudy chiaroscuro, you know, that transition of light to dark that gives that illusion of, of three-dimensionality. It had that quality to it. And I was, I was painting. I was saying, well, how can I do this with painting? So I started playing these big puddles of water on the, you know, in the painting itself. And these, these cloudy forms emerged that uh, modeled themselves. They had that, that transition from light to dark, or from more pigment to less pigment, that gave them the appearance of three-dimensionality. So that was very exciting. That's very liberating when you know that you, know, you, can, you can trust the forces of nature to do okay. But you're right, it is also very stressful, because sometimes uh, I'll put down like a layer of color here, and I'll, I'll put the, the water on it, and I won't know what it looks like until the next day. And most of these values that you see here aren't paint directly out of the tube. They're a mixture of some various colors. And when you wet them, those pigments will start to separate. And the ones that show up the most when they separate can be hard to predict. So maybe something turns out way too red when actually I want it to show up as more green. So it, it can be stressful. This, this one here. Uh, I got all the way to the point where I thought it was finished, and then I said, you know what, that sucks. So I started again. I went through the same sequence of, of layers again, until I liked it. So yes, uh, to answer your question, is it liberating or is it stressful? Yes. <laughs> so, were the layers of varnish to prevent other pigments from spreading into the new pigments that you added? The, the layers of varnish in between uh, really resulted from more of the fact that each of these layers of paint is a very thin layer of glaze, okay, as opposed to my old works that could be you know, an inch thick. Uh, so what happens is if you get uh, a little piece of dust or a little speck onto that, that work of art, then that just accumulates the, the paint every time. And it just builds and it just grinds at you. <laughs> and if you peel that off, then you're peeling away layers and layers of color. So this piece here is actually not varnished between each layer. Okay? But I moved for varnishing between each layer. Same with this one. This is not varnished between each layer. Uh, I moved the varnishing between each layer so I could seal down that coat of glaze. Okay? The, the glaze itself, I've also washed away a lot of the binders. So if you don't seal it down, you can easily wash it away again, even though I'm working with acrylic, which is a, a waterproof medium. But I seal down that layer, and then I actually sand it. So if there are any imperfections there, I'm, I'm wiping it away. And then I do the next layer of color, and then I seal that under and sand it. Okay? And that, that helps add to some of the, the color depth that you see, too. Because you're not just seeing, you know, when you're looking at a work like this, you're not just seeing, oh, I think that blue. You're seeing through layer after layer of paint. And in a way of locking in those layers and really, really keeping them in place is varnishing. So it's not so much that I was worried about the layers of color mixing, it's more that I was worried about washing away some of those other layers. Yes? Why did you choose such a light set of frames for such a dark set of Such a light set of frames for such a dark set of games. Well, if you, uh, if you take a frame and you paint it, um, there are some technical issues that arise. For one, the frames will stick together if they're, if they're painted. Okay? Um, two, the, the lightness helps offset that darkness a little bit. And, and when you have a nice neutral wall like this, you have this little brief instance of light before you return to something that's a little more neutral. Okay? Um, the, the, I started using these strip frames. For a while, I was just painting the edges of, of my overall support. Uh, but I started using these strip frames because with all those layers of varnish, uh, I couldn't lean my paintings against each other anymore. It also would actually create dents and imperfections in the varnish. So the, the frames really are to keep the painted surfaces separate from each other. And uh, the best way to do that, I've found, is simply you know, slice up these pieces of wood by myself and, and leave them untreated. If I, if I even put a coat of varnish on them to seal them, then they would still stick together. So any kind of paint, any kind of varnish would, would make those, those uh, frames stick together. So there, there are certainly technical reasons as well as visual reasons. Yeah. 
think you had a question. I, would, um, I was wondering in the process of painting, do you use a brush at all? Or is it uh, like when you're putting a, a color across or what? There, there is a brush used. Um, but part of my process is also kind of minimizing my presence in the work. If we see obvious brush strokes, then it becomes obviously something that a person did. And that's another way that I differ from the abstract expressionist, because then you can't look at a work of abstract expressionism without imagining that artist there painting that work. Uh, but I've actually decided to minimize my um, presence in the work. Uh, again, kind of stripping out that, that physical element. Uh, but each layer of varnish, or, or not varnish, but each glaze layer of color I put down, that is brushed on. Yeah. And then the, the sections that I remove, I'm often kind of pouring water or, or mixing more water with it to the point that you can't see brush marks. Okay. Okay. So what remains are the, are the marks left by that water rather than marks I made. But you can certainly see brush marks in some of these pores on the wood. I'm, how many layers are typically on these? I see six on this one that I could count. I it, at least more. four or five, usually. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, in the, uh, this area right up here, there's like we have three. Are uh, those separate here? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, is that each, three each separate? Time, each time I'm, I'm putting down the water, usually in the same place, but that water's not going to move the same way it did before. Yeah, sure. Because, you know, the, the slightest angle of the table or the way that the work itself is bending or how much I've actually tilted, or if I've tilted it at all, all of these, you know, multitude of factors can go into where this water is going to move. So, yeah, sometimes you see the same area that has, you know, various contours because you're looking at um, many layers um, I was going to ask, like, if there any, was there any point that you had a paint, a certain painting that you felt that you had completed quick succession and then you accidentally messed it up? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, you would be amazed how many paintings I have uh, struggled over just in the varnishing process. It's just getting that varnish right. You know, uh, I've experimented with so many different varnishes to try to get a varnish that, that you know, won't leave brush marks that would be really distracting. And, and uh, what I've come up with is um, I'm using a Liquitex uh, solute bar, it's a solvent-based varnish. But the matte varnish is too matte and the glossy varnish is too glossy, so I concoct my own little uh, mixture of them. And I have to apply two layers of that because if I don't, then it's kind of cloudy. Uh, but if I have to apply a third layer because the second layer came out cloudy as well, then it gets too glossy and then sometimes I have to strip off all of that varnish to start again. So, yes, that would be a big affirmative. Yeah. Happy accident. Happy act. Well, I'm not very happy with it. <laughs> One of the things that I, you know, we're teaching, um, I know the students in the painting class are um, uh, learning to traditional oil. oil uh, Techniques. And one of the things that, uh, that, I'm always, that I'm always harping on it for is to, to keep in mind that the you know, paintings are built from to the back to the front, and uh, that um, big mistake to make is think you're work, think is if you think you are working on the last pass on a painting, because uh, you when you get in the mindset of like okay now I'll just do this 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 and this and I'll be done. When you get in that mindset instead of like I'll do this today and then we'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, you, you can really um, uh, pay, uh, uh, just jinx yourself, basically. So you find a similar thing of like when you're, what, what happens so often, your people like to say, ask, uh, you know, how do you know when a painting's done? And, and I usually find that like if the painting is done, it sort of announces itself to you. You, know, you, you, you didn't know, you didn't see it coming. You're just like, oh. Oh, I'm like, I guess this is done. It can be, with, with my process, it's much more about steps. Um, because, you know, I'll do the laser color, or the laser color, I'll put the water on it, it has to dry until the next day. Once it's dry, then I have to spray varnish it to settle everything down, and then I have to 
a paint varnish on it to really seal it in, and then I have to sand it in order to get the next layer. So there is very much a process for that. But one of the things of, of reading Robert Motherwell's writings, and I would strongly encourage all of you, if you want to be an artist, if you are interested in an artist, read what they have written. Don't just read what people have said about their work, but read their own words. Because they might be trying to convey something uh, that you're trying to convey. And even if they do it in a very different way, you can still learn from that philosophy a little bit. But when I was reading Motherwell, uh, looking into him especially for my master's thesis, uh, he really encouraged experimentation, doodling. And at one point, I would look at my paintings and I would say, OK, this is the kind of format I want to have. I'm going to use these colors. And when I get to that last stage, I'm going to be done. Um, I've, I've moved more away from that. You know, I have my plan, I have that, that, that layout, but then I look at it when I am you know, thinking I'm going to be done, and I ask myself, is this really done? Am I really happy? You know, at certain points, I would have been inclined to say, OK, yeah, that's good enough. I went through the steps. It's finished. Uh, but more and more, I'm, I'm really much more picky about it, and I say, well, this, this is, you know, I wanted to end on this layer, but it's not looking the way I want to look. So what I need to do is I need to go back to the very first layer and then build it up again from there just because of the process. So again, a, a painting like this, if I get to that fourth or fifth layer and it's not where I want it to be, then I have to go back to layer number one. And maybe I, you know, even the layer before the first layer would be just primer, just make it all white again. Okay, so there's, there's a, a, a one painting in particular that a friend of mine owns now. I painted it three times because I got to the last stage and, and something messed up. You know, you're asking about something frustrating. A little, little thing of dust and I'm trying to pick it off with my nail. And because that's uh, such a thin glaze, I scratched through five layers of color right down to the, the primary one. And you can't cover that up and make it look like the rest of the paint. So I went back to white and I started over again. Again. <laughs> I'm a, a trooper and you should hear me in the studio. <laughs> yes, yes. You make a sale of blush.
you know, when you're tearing, you're working in oil paint, and, and usually when you're working in acrylic paint, you can, you know, maybe paint a red ball, and the next day you say, like, oh, I don't really like that red, you paint over it. Um, with watercolor, you, you don't really do that. And you can lift out some color, but you really have to have uh, that planning. And with the, the technique that I use, also, again, if, if I get a little scratch in the surface, I can't just paint over that and make it look like the rest of the surface. I would have to build up all those layers again. Kind of like fresco. Uh, a little bit. If you're not finished with that fresco by the time the plaster dries, then you have to chip it all off and start again. I would have loved to hear Michelangelo cursing the town. But they did. <laughs> they did, though. Yeah. They certainly did. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I just um, uh, want to uh, ask you to join me in thanking uh, Sean for coming and sharing not only his work, but sharing um, his thoughts about his work. So.